Creating forms in Flutter often results in a lot of boilerplate code, especially when fields are validated and the form should react to changes. The developers of the package Flutter Form Builder have addressed this problem and created an efficient alternative to the traditional Flutter forms. In this video, I will show you how to set up the Flutter Form Builder package and the numerous features that make our daily work much easier. Let's get into some syntactical operations. To set up the package, we first have to add the dependency in the pubspec yaml file. After that, we add the import statement at the top of the file in which we would like to use the package. Then define a global key which uniquely identifies the form widget and allows validation of the form. And don't put it into the build method as this would recreate the key on every build cycle. To make use of the datetime picker of the package, we also need the intl package, which provides us with internationalization and localization facilities. With that done, we are ready to go. Now that we have everything in place, we can create the form builder widget and as we would do it with the traditional Flutter forms, we of course provide it with the global key by using the key attribute. To make use of multiple input widgets, we provide the child attribute with a column widget and at the very bottom of our column widget, we can add a row widget, which will hold two buttons, one for submitting and another one for resetting the form. The onpressed attribute of the submit button will hold a function which will process the form inputs only if they are valid, which is the case when the save and validate method of our form's current state returns true. If the form gets successfully processed, we can print the results by using current state value. To clear all the inputs, we use current state reset on our reset button. Now let's have a look on the available input widgets that are included in the package. At the moment there are 24, which we will go through in quick succession. The single checkbox is one of the most common form fields and allows only two options, yes or no. Which is why this could for example be used to check for the user's agreement of your conditions and terms. Later in the video I will show you how exactly to implement the validation logic. For multiple choice selections use the checkbox list or group. On submission the single checkbox returns a single boolean, whereas the checkbox list and group returns a list of the selected values. Later in the video I will also show you how to access all the values that have been submitted. Another way to give users a choice between certain opportunities and visually more appealing are the chip widgets. With the choice chip widget, a single chip can be selected which will be highlighted in your predefined color. The filter chips widget acts like a checkbox list or group and lets you choose multiple options. Last we have the chips input widget, which provides a text input field and gives you instant feedback on your search term. On submission we get all the selected values either by a single value or a list. Next we have some awesome pickers. A color picker which provides you with a user-friendly interface to choose your desired color. And even if you're not satisfied with the interface you can easily change it by using another color picker type. The country picker contains a huge list of countries which you can filter for by entering a value into the text input field. With a date time picker you can select a single date and time. And with a date range picker you can set a period by selecting a start and end date. With the image picker you can either take a photo with your camera or choose an image from your gallery. On submission we get the selected color with a hex value by the color picker, a country name by the country picker, a single date time value by the date time picker, a list of two date time values by the date time range and a relative file path to your selected image. Next we have two slider widgets, the default slider which lets you choose a certain value that is between a predefined min and max value and the range slider which acts similar as the date range slider but outputs only number values. On submission we get a single double and a range values object which contains the start and end value. 
Then we have some other very common widgets. All of them are single choice inputs. The radio list acts like the checkbox list, but you can only select one of the given options. The radio group is exactly the same, but it gives you the opportunity to order the options either vertically or horizontally. The drop down list opens a selection when you click on it and the switch can be turned on or off, which is similar to the single checkbox. Then we have different text input variations. We have the well-known text input field, which lets us type custom text. By default, it is set as a multi-line text field, but with the max line attribute, we can change that. We can also make it a password field by enabling the obscure text attribute. The phone field holds a long list of country codes and even shows the flag of the selected country. And with the type ahead, we have a text input field that acts like a search bar and shows up suggestions based on the given input. Last but not least, we have a few special widgets that are probably not used too often but are still very useful. We have the touch spin, which lets you increment and decrement to select a certain number. The rate widget, which is probably very useful for e-commerce applications where customers can leave a rating on the products. The segmented control widget, which is similar but highlights only the selected option. And finally, the signature pad, which you can use to draw or write your signature. I'm not quite sure why it's so laggy at the moment, but maybe it performs better on a real device. So much for the input fields, let's move on to the next topic. Let's talk about attributes. There are some core attributes that are supported by all input types I just mentioned. We have one attribute that is called attribute, which takes a string and represents the key in the form value map, which is created on form submission. This one is required in every single input type because it identifies the form field. The attribute is needed to access values of your form map and for initializing form fields with predefined values. To set an initial value of an input field, you can use the initial value attribute. You can either set it right inside your input widget or, which I think is the most convenient way, you can set it inside your form builder widget. There you have to provide a map which holds the attribute names of all the input fields you wish to have an initial value. If I wanted the text input field to have an initial value of hello world, I would add the attribute as a key and set the value of this key to hello world. The read only attribute is self-explanatory. It will set the input field as readable only and block the user from typing something in. With the decoration attribute, you have the freedom to customize the styling of any of the input widgets by providing a customized input decoration object. Next is my favorite one, the validators attribute. This one will take a list of form field validator objects and at the moment there are 13 built-in validators which we will discuss later in the video and you can add your own custom validators as well. Then we have the unchanged attribute which is also well known and should be self-explanatory. And last but not least, we have a value transformer attribute, which takes a function that will transform the field value before saving the form. For example, you could use this to change data types or to remove white spaces of a string before saving. Now let's have a look on the validators that are built in and how to create a custom validator. So first we have the required validator, if this is activated, then this forces the user to put something into the input field. And if this is empty, then we cannot submit the form, get an error message, this field cannot be empty. So we have to type something in, in order to process the form. Next one is the numeric validator. This one forces the user to put only numbers inside the text input field. So if I type something like this in, then we get an error message, value must be numeric. So we have to type a number inside this in order to process the form. Additionally, with the min and max validators, we can force the user to put a number inside the text input widget, which matches a certain range. So if I type 
minus 100, then we get the error message value must be greater than or equal to zero. If I type 101, value must be less than or equal to 100. But if we are inside the range, then the form gets processed. Same goes for strings. We can set a minimum length and a maximum length. In this case, 10 and 15. If I type something in, I just type some numbers so we can see how long this string is. If I type the numbers one to nine, so we have a string that has a length of nine characters, we get an error message value must have a length greater than or equal to 10. So if I type zero, then we can submit it. And if we are over 15, then we get another error message value must have a length less than or equal to 15. Next one is the pattern validator. And this one forces the user to put something into the text input field that matches a certain pattern. In this case, I took an email pattern, which you can see here. It's very long. Just took it from the source code of this function. And yeah, as you can see, if I type now something inside, which is obviously no email address, then we get an error message. Value does not match pattern. If I add, add symbol, still no email, some letters, still no email. But if I complete the email address, then can process the form. And we don't need this kind of pattern because there's already an email validator built in. So this one works exactly like the one before. Then we have the URL validator and this one forces us to type in a URL. So if I type this inside, then we get an error message. This field requires a valid URL address. So I complete this now and we can process the form if we type in valid URL. With the IP address validator, we can force the user to put a valid IP address inside the text input field. So if I type something like this, then we get, of course, an error message. If the number of the octet is outside of the range of an IP address, and the range goes from 0 to 255, so if we type 256, then we get an error message. So if we are inside the range, then everything works. Also, if we provide only three octets instead of four, then we get also an error message. The credit card validator forces us to put a 16 digit number inside this text input field. So this one is fine. If we have one less, then we also get an error message. So this has to be 16 digits. Next, there's the date validator. This one forces us to put a valid date inside this text input field. For example, today's date. So this one works, but if we change this to the invalid date, then of course we get an error message. The last one is the required true validator. This one is perfect for single checkboxes or the switch where you can provide a Boolean and the Boolean in this case has always to be true if you have set this validator. To create a custom validator, we just need an anonymous function which has an if statement like this one. This one checks if the input value is yes. And if it's true, then the form gets processed or the validation is accepted. But if it's not yes, then get an error message, which is the answer must be yes. So if I type no, then of course we get the error message. But if I type yes, then the form gets processed. Let's have a look on conditional validation. So we can create input fields that are dependent on the option that was chosen on another input field. For example, here we want to get some 
feedback from our our user can choose awesome good or bad if he chooses bad then we would like to have some kind of specification so i will create a text input field right below so this one will have reason as an attribute so this is the key inside of our form map then a decoration input decoration with a label text of if bad why so now we have to specify a custom validator this one will check if the user chose bad on our feedback input field so now you will see how to access values of your form map so we take the global key and then we want the current state attribute fields and now we have to specify the key that we want to look at or the value that we want to get with a certain key so the key for this one is radio. We want to check which of these options is selected. Now, current state value. This will get us a dynamic value of the selected option. Now we want to check if this one is equal to bad. And we check if the value that has been entered is null or the value as a string is empty. And of course I made a mistake here. Before we can use the if statement, we need an anonymous function. So if bad has been selected, then the specification text input field has to hold some value. So let's save it. And now if I choose awesome, we can submit the form. Good, submit it, bad. Now we have to specify. The very last topic I'd like to cover is how to build your own custom form field. First of all, you will need a form builder custom field object that also takes an attribute and a form field. Form field itself needs a builder. The builder itself is a function which takes a form field state of dynamic. This function has to return our custom form field. And the widget that we will return is an input decorator, which takes an input decoration with a label text and a content padding and some other styling attributes. And the child of this input decorator is a container with a height of 200. And the child of the container is a Cupertino picker with an item extent of 30 and the children will take this option list which I um, specified here at the top and this will convert it to this kind of view. The very last part of this video I'd like to thank Mr. Danvik Miller for creating such an awesome package and if you also like to pay some tribute to Mr. Miller then go to the pubdev package site and hit the like button or go to the github site and give it a star and if you want to go one step further then go to the buy me a coffee site and buy mr miller a tasteful coffee all of the sites i will link of course in the video description if this video was helpful and you watched so far then please leave me some kind of feedback if you like to support me and my channel then subscribe and share this video and yeah what else can i say have a nice day and hopefully we will see us in the next video.